Welcome back to the channel, Chris Morrison, Gulfside Ministries, and I'm really excited to finally get back to, we'll just call this season two of the Greek, uh, learning Greek by reading the Greek New Testament series here, lesson eight. We're going to look at one verse, John 119. Uh, just in terms of an FYI, because it's been almost a year since I've been away from these, I have some uh, some studies already done, some PowerPoints created. So the plan is released these every other week. If you don't know, there are several other projects I'm working on here at Gulfside at the same time, but these I'm putting on every other week to go out. So again, pay attention. These are going to be coming out regularly. I am just so you know, going to be limiting each to one verse at a time because there's plenty to go through in one verse. Previously, I was doing several verses at a time. We're just going to hit one verse, get them in, get them out, get them done and next one on. And then once we get far, far enough in, I'm going to pause and do a couple of proper, just, just full on grammar videos. So that'll be coming in the meantime. If you have grammatical questions, always questions, comments, cries of outrage in the comments below. But let's uh, pause here. Uh, not pause. Let's jump right into John chapter one, verse 19. By the way, um, if you don't know, if you don't remember, check the the uh, playlist for the first seven lessons up through here. You'll see several background changes because we've moved several times since I've <laughs> initially started these. So we've already done one through 18 verse by verse, and I'm assuming that you've already watched those. And if not, here is John 1, 19 in Greek, and I'm going to read it. It should sound a little something like this. I haute est in a martria tu Ioannu, haste a pestelen hoi judaio ex Jerusalemon. All right, and what does that mean? Well, this is your new vocabulary. And notice this is a most of this verse is all vocabulary you've not seen before. But I hope you're going to see pretty quickly that none of this is especially hard. Uh, so let's just uh, go, jump right in and see what, by the way, the words that you already should know, Kai, you should know, and hey is your is your definite article. Martria, we've had before, that means a witness. Tu is your genitive. Uh, it's an article, it means of. Hoi, again, your your article, this case is the nominative plural. Um, hex, we've seen, X, we've seen before is out of or from. Again, Kai, Hina means uh, so that, and Autan uh, is uh, it or them or something like that, them. So uh, let's look at all these other words for you know, voc new vocabulary. This is this is what you're looking at. Apestelan means they sent. Haute, and we're going to talk about that. Haute, that's haute. Notice the roof breath breathing mark is a devotional pronoun meaning this. A means you are. So it's, um, it's the like um, I am, you are, he, she, it. Uh, so it's are. Erotesosin is they ask. Uh, let's see, esten, this is, or he is, or it is, or whatever, it's is. Hires is priests, that's plural, hires is priests. Erasalumon is Jerusalem, or in this case, it's from Jerusalem or out of Jerusalem because it's in the genitive. Yudaioi is the Jews. Yuanu is John or of John because it's in the genitive. Luitas is the Levites. Matria is a witness or a testimony. You've seen other versions of that word previously already. Hate means when. Su means you. And tis means who or what. So that's all the vocabulary that you need to know. Take some time to learn that vocabulary. When, when you do, you should be able to provide a very wooden translation that should sound something like this. And this is the witness or the testimony of John when they sent the Jews of Jerusalem, uh, priests and Levites, so that they might ask him, you, uh, you who are, or you are who? Okay, so that's pretty easy to understand just with a basic level translation. Let's now go into some of the grammar that you need to know to get a little deeper into this. The first I've already mentioned is the demonstrative pronoun haute. Again, notice that rough breathing mark. It's not haute. Haute is uh, a version of hutas. Hutas, I believe you've already seen. Uh, is a so hutas versus a kainas. Hutas 
and therefore haute means this, kainos means that. These are demonstrative pronouns. Now, I, I do want to say we have seen the word ekainos once before. I think it was back in verse nine, if I recall. You can go back and check your Greek text. I noticed in my previous videos, I didn't mention ekainos and I should have, but ekainos means that one, uh, whereas hutos means, hutos is this one. So keep that in mind, hutos, this one, and therefore in this particular um um, how they were talking about why just a second it's how they are not hutas. So what I want you to keep in mind is that it's a near versus far demonstrative language. I can say this is, or that is. So this is, is language that's very close to you trying to bring it up right here. I could say something like this, this is my book, or I could say that is my book. And you kind of get the sense then of, of what we're trying to do with those words. So ekainos is your that, the one far away. Hutas and his derivatives are the ones that are close up. Uh, so near versus far. Now, anytime you have a demonstrative pronoun, hutas or ekainos, they can function as adjectives. So they're describing a noun or they can function as pronouns. So they just are uh, the pronoun that we're actually, that we're working with. Uh, in this case, it's going to be a pronoun. This is the witness. When it's a pronoun, so think back to English pronouns, pronouns replace nouns, he, she, it, they, etc. As a pronoun, the case, so in this case, it's, um, it's going to be, uh, it, it's nominative. The case is determined by function in the sentence and by the number and gender of its antecedents. So look in this particular sentence. We have how they, well, what is it's the witness. This is the witness. The witness is what it's referring to. And so the witness is in the nominative case. And it's a feminine. It's hey, martria. It's not ha martria or martrias. Hey, martria, which makes it feminine. And so you want the feminine version of hutas. And the feminine version of hutas is haute. So that's why it's hey, or kai, haute is then hey, martria. So haute matches Martria. Now, if it were an adjective, the case number and gender would all be determined by the noun. So the nice thing here, because word order doesn't matter, if you're not sure which word it modifies, just check the case and number, and that will give you a sense. It cannot modify a word that it doesn't match in case number or gender. And there's some places, by the way, that that's important um, when you go to interpret the Bible. Uh, a little bit different context. Go check out Ephesians 2 verses uh verse eight and nine see if you can see a little something there use your little uh use your um ask yourself what the gift is what does the this refer back to anyway another story for another day uh, number next let's talk about the uh hey martria tu yowanu tu yowanu so tu yowanu is a genitive and again you know that because of the omicron upsilon ending so anytime you have a genitive, it's always going to modify a noun. And in this case, the noun that it's modifying, hey, martria, is a nominative case. And the purpose, so it's, it's the witness of John. So this is telling us the purpose of this genitive. It establishes a relationship between John and the witness. It's telling us who the, the testimony belongs to. It belongs to John. So whenever you look at this, you want to, you have, hey, martria to Yuanu. Make sure that you keep your article and your noun and your article with your genitive and your genitive. Keep those all together as a single phrase and try to translate them together. The witness of John. Another simple key word to translate a genitive with is the word of. Just stick the word of in there anytime you see a genitive and it will almost always work. And English happened, the English word of tends to have a broad enough language that it can catch most of the ideas and your ear can kind of figure out what's going on. So, hey, Martria to Yoanu, the witness of John. So again, we can talk about this further in Greek, but that there's some ambiguity because is that the witness of John, does that mean I'm telling you something about John? It's the witness of John or is it the witness belonging to John? I think we can all probably see in context is talking about John's witness. And if you're not sure, keep reading on and that becomes... That becomes clear. Uh, and if the Omicron Upsilon ending doesn't immediately of Yuanu doesn't tell you, oh, this is a genitive because you're still learning and that's okay, uh, get really good at noting two is a genitive ending, a genitive article. So your article, remember, is always going to match the noun that it modifies. And if you immediately can tell that two is a genitive singular and masculine, no less, you'll immediately, you, you'll immediately know Yuanu is also a genitive singular masculine. So a quick cheat code. Because sometimes the words in Greeks and noun, the nouns in Greek uh, can get 
as declensions can get really complicated. Uh, you can some, I can't I can't figure if that's a if that's a feminine or not. Check to see if there is uh, an article associated with it. If there is, it's a, it's a cheat. Oh, that well, that must be a that must be a genitive. So much for genitives. Let's now let's continue looking. So then it goes on and says the hate a pestelan o yudaioi. So this is a verb. A pestelan is a verb which means they uh, sent. So. A pestilon is an inflected version, which means that's we, we've changed the word to change the spelling to know something about it. The base form of the word I have here listed is apostello. Apostello means I send. That omega ending there on the end, right there, apostello. I know it's apa from that alpha p omicron. Apa stello, I send that O makes it a singular ending, apa stello. And therefore, the way we've changed this makes it an aorist active indicative. Remember, indicative just means that it's a statement of fact. Aorist, we're going to think of that as a past tense. We're now active, it's actually doing the verb uh, as opposed to passive. Third person, they, and it's plural. Third person would be, uh, could be also he, she, it, but they because it's plural. So all that is built into into the spelling. What's the spelling? Well, the apa, know that becomes ape. So anytime you have an air standing, again, you're going to see a lot of this. You don't have to memorize it. Just get a feel for it. That that epsilon in the epsilon is going to get tacked on at the beginning, or you're going to have a lengthened vowel and or apa is going to ape. So that epsilon is going to get tagged on there. And the alpha nu ending the on is what's going to let you know it's third person plural. So Apestelon just sounds different than apostello. So just try to get a feel for that apestelon, that e on sound, that e on that in the middle. That give a sense of that for that being we're going to call a past tense. At this in this point in Greek studies, you can think about an aorist functioning as a simple past tense. It's a common usage of the aorist of the aorist. There's other ways. The word is the aorist is used. It doesn't always mean simple past tense, but it's an extremely common usage of an aorist is a simple past tense. And I think I told you this in a previous lesson. The last one, lesson seven, may have been left lesson six. At, at your early stages, you're going to really struggle with what's called parsing, knowing what's an aorist, what person. What that's going to you're just going to get lost. Make sure you go to a site like gntreader.com, pull out an inter, an interlinear or something like that. And in, you can just click this word, even strong, like blue letter Bible. You can just click it and it will automatically give you the parsing. So if I if I forget this parsing, but I know apostello means um, I send. And if I just memorize it, then you can say, oh, well, that's an heiress. That just means sent. That means they sent. So that's kind of how you work a basic translation out of that. Now, number next, who sent? Well, the subject is hoyudaioi. Notice that the subject comes after the verb. Again, we don't do that in English. A lot of languages do place the subject after. Again, the subject can go anywhere in the sentence. How do we know this? This is the subject. Well, A, it's a noun, but B, it's the case. The case that hoy is a nominative plural, udaioi makes it a nominative plural. And since it's the nominative, that makes it the subject of the verb. So they sent. Who sent? The Jews are the ones that sent. So word or does not determine meaning. And we know that, again, it's a nominative plural because of the hoi ending. Next part of this. So we have hate, apestelon, hoi yudaio. All that makes sense. When they sent the Jews, you can say when the Jews sent. Now, what is this ex hirasalumon? Ex yara salumon. So ex yara salumon is, again, this is a genitive, that own ending. Uh, so two ways of this is genitive. First of all, that own ending is going to be genitive. But second of all, hex or ex rather is a, um, uh, We've I believe we've seen that previously. That means out of or from any time you see the preposition ex, it's always going to be followed by a genitive. Always. So ex yara salumon is another genitive construct. So it's here, again, put the of there. You could translate X of or from. Just try of, and I see what I mean. The Jews of Jerusalem. 
Well, that makes sense. The Jews of Jerusalem. So I can translate that is well. This is of means this is that they're this is where they're coming from. That makes sense, right? If you were to call me Chris of Florida, that means I'm I, I come from Florida right now, and so the Jews of Jerusalem, the Jews from Jerusalem. Now, a quick note about this particular word. Yerasalumon, anytime they put it in the genitive, they put it in the plural. That's what I should say. Anytime they need to say of Jerusalem, they're going to put that in the genitive form. Why? Or the plural form. Why? Because that's the way that their language happened to work at that time. It's worth noting at this point, uh, the rules of grammar are less rules. It's not like sometimes argue, well, that's good grammar, that's bad grammar. It's less about the rules that makes a good grammar or bad grammar. And it's more about the rules that we're telling you explain as much as possible the way they act, the way they actually happen, the, their descriptions of the way the language worked. And sometimes uh, whatever language you're in English, we just sometimes we violate the rules. That's just the way that it is. And that's just the way that we happen to speak sometimes. So that's just one where anytime that the uh, have a genitive, they're just going to put in the plural with this particular word, Jerusalem, Jerusalem. So just keep that in mind. So we've seen the subject, which is the Jews from Jerusalem. And we've seen the verb, which is they sent. Now, what about this next part? Yereskai luitas. Yereskai luitas is your, we might say, direct object. This is telling you what was sent. So the what did they send? So they, the Jews from Jerusalem, they sent, what did they send? They sent priests and Levites. You know that they're the direct objects because they are in the accusative case. Again, notice that is and os ending. When you get into what's called a third declension noun, you're going to see that, oh, well, these are accusative case. Accusative case are going to receive the action. That makes them our direct object. Again, so we could have put that earlier in the sentence. They put that later in the sentence. The important thing here is that something was sent. And what was sent is the priests and the Levites. Uh, so again, they're going to function as a direct object of the verb. Now, why were they sent? So again, notice we've had that they were sent, who, the, who was sent, where they were sent from, um, and then now why they were sent. Why they were sent was hia, I'm uh, sorry, hina erotesosin, hina erotesosin. Erotesosin is what's called a subjunctive verb. Don't worry too much about subjunctive, the word right now, other than to say subjunctive is a type of, uh, it's, it's compared to the indicative. The, if the indicative just, this is the case, the subjunctive is used to tell you uh, what the purpose of something is, why, one of the reasons to use it is why we did something. Anytime you have a hina clause followed by a subjunctive, you're almost this is almost always going to be a statement of purpose. The reason that they sent was so that they might ask him. So erotao is the verb meaning I ask. Erotesosin is the subjunctive of that so that they might ask. That's the purpose. They were sent so that they might ask him. So again, anytime you have a hina followed by a subjunctive, Go back to um, John chapter one, verses seven and eight, that same idea. You can find it and see it there. Uh, and again, it's to all, uh, almost always going to be to show purpose. So when I'm reading Greek and I see Hina clauses, stacked up Hina clauses, I'll get to go, oh, this is for this purpose. This is for this purpose. This is for this purpose. That makes the text really clear what is going on. So what did they ask him? They might, they might ask him what? They might ask him, Suti say, who are you? Who and and a uh, couple of things about this. First of all, that little semicolon at the end, please note, remember that your original Greek text didn't use capitalization or punctuation. So the semicolon here, the which function is a question mark, that's been added by your editors. That doesn't mean we're adding to the word of God. There's that's that's a question. It's pretty obvious. I just tell you this to say there are going to be some places where the punctuation isn't obvious. And in fact, we've already seen one of those back in verse two and three. And those are the places where this will come up as well. So just be aware as you're actually studying the text that sometimes uh, editors choose punctuation that you may disagree with, and that's okay. You're allowed to say, well, wait just a minute. Maybe this works better as a comma, or maybe this works better as the continuation of the sentence. So uh, in this case, it's obviously fair. Who are you is in fact the question. And again, notice the word order. It's su ti se. They didn't say tu, they didn't say ti se. Tise su, who are you? It's you who are, who are you? So the, the emphasis is on you. It's like they're pointing up, who, who do you think you are? 
this person, who are you? The emphasis is on they're trying to identify the the identity of John is the central question. And you put that all together, the whole purpose of this is the Jews of Jerusalem, that religious authority, they're trying to identify the identity of John. That's the whole point of this verse. So before we do some interpretation, let's, let's just smooth out that translation. It was already pretty easy earlier, but it goes something like this. And this is the witness, or we say testimony. This is the testimony of John. This, this is the testimony of John when the Jews from Jerusalem sent priests and Levites that they might ask him, who are you? Easy enough, right? Now, a few interpretational notes. I mentioned earlier this near versus far language. So uh, this is the testimony of John, the near language plus the present tense of esten. So esten is happening right now. Let's say this was the testimony of John. It says, this is, this that I'm giving you right here in front of me, this is the testimony of John. It's almost like we're confronting the reader with his continued testimony. And I want you to compare that um, back with verse 15. This is right here the testimony in front of us. And so this isn't merely a historical event. This is the testimony. Well, what's the test? We're going to find out next week what the testimony is, but the testimony is going to be that he's not the Christ, that this one who comes after him is. Next, the that whole middle section on the authority of the inquisitors is what is being emphasized. They are from Jerusalem and that they're the ones that are sending these religious officials. Keep in mind, Jerusalem is the uh, not only capital of the uh, of of Israel, but it's the it's it's the it's the center of religious authority, especially where the temple is. And so, who are we sending? We're sending religious authority. So this very much has this image of an official religious mission, which is going to be really important in the book of John going forward as we're setting up the the, the conflicts between Jesus and the Udayoi, the Jews, the uh, people sometimes worry this is anti-Semitic. It's not. We're talking about the concern of the religious leadership because Jesus's claims are ultimately uh, in, in that ancient sense political. I don't think they're political so much in the modern sense, but in the sense of he's claiming to be the, the, the king of Israel. And in fact, the whole purpose of John is going to be who this Jesus is and whether or not the religious leadership affected him. And we'll see that as we go through the book of John. And so therefore, the purpose of these religious authorities question is to ascertain the identity of Jesus. That's the reason that they sent this this question. And so I want to encourage you by the check out John um, uh, 120. I go forward a uh, verse, but then also a couple of verses, but also, also at the end of the book, chapter 20, verse 31, these things are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the son of God, that by believing you might have life in his name. So the book is going to begin and end with the point of we're trying to forget the identity. If the identity of John is one who's preaching Jesus and the identity of Jesus is 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 the Messiah, that's really what the whole purpose of the book is about. That's why John's testimony is important. And what we're setting up right here in chapter one, you're feeling, I hope you're feeling the tension that's building already between Jesus and the religious authorities. There's a tension that's already being built that's going to get expanded on a lot. And that, by the way, holds the seeds to some really important issues about uh, why people believe and why people don't believe. And if you kind of put yourself in the mind of these religious authorities, empathize with them a bit, they had some expectations. And uh, that says a lot, I think, today for people. So if you're preaching this passage and teaching this passage, um, you can probably, there's a lot that you can dig into there. So um, I'm glad that we're back to our Greek studies. Uh, leave your questions, comments, cries of outrage below here in a couple of weeks. We will do, oh, next week, we'll do verse 20. And uh, we will just keep going. And until next time, may God richly bless you.